those, Father, who are listed in our bulletin, and those, Father, who are with us this morning, continue to recover as uh, you lay their, your hands on them. Father, I'd ask a special prayer for our sister Bella and David as uh, they are about to uh, bring a new member into your family. Father, pray with, uh, with them for the next uh, month or so uh, if things go well. For those, Father, who are lost, searching for a way, they're probably not going to look for you, so it's up to us to take you to them, show them by example there is a better way. I pray, Father, for our families who are suffering through the hurricanes in the last couple of weeks that have devastated the southern part of the country. Praying, Father, that they will seek you for refuge, knowing that they are in much need of the things that we take for granted. <laughs> fresh water, something to eat. Many volunteers have, have gone down to help them, Father, and I ask that you please be with them, uh, especially uh, Brother Nick Sadowski and his crew. Uh, that comes close to home for many of us that uh, he is willing to do that. We pray, Father, that they will be safe. As we go through our life on this earth, I pray that we will show you in us, to everyone around us, that they will see Jesus, they will want to know how we can remain confident and comfortable in a world full of sin and evil. We're not the first ones who have had to do that, Father, and I know that you have had your hand in helping many of you. Give us strength, give us wisdom, but most of all, Give us the love of your son Jesus to go to everyone else. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Jesus did not come into the world to make bad men good. He came into the world to make dead men alive. We'll sing this selection as we focus our thoughts and our minds and our souls on the Lord's Supper. <clears throat>
Yet the greatest gift of all, worth more than ten thousand dollars, worth more than any amount of money, <clears throat> worth more than anything else in this whole world. John three sixteen. Yeah. Everyone knows that. God's a loving world. He gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should have eternal life. Question. How many people do you think would take advantage of and believe God's promise of this very gift of all? How many? A few? A lot? A whole lot. Well, let Jesus answer that way. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Paraphrase. The gate is wide, and men find the beach to destroy. The gate is narrow, and few find the beach to lie. How many do you think would take advantage of the greatest gift ever? Few or a lot? So why was Jesus so willing to send Jesus into the world to give eternal life to those who, who believe and choose to follow him? To those few. The words uh, to the song we just sang ask those questions. Also gives the answer to this question. Why did my Savior come to earth? Why did he choose a lonely bird? Why did he drink that bitter cup? Why on the cross he lifted up? The answer? Because he loves me so. It's time. We say the answer to that question. Why did my sin come to earth? Because he loved us. Do you think that sometimes we sing some songs without fully grasping what we're singing? Notice how personal these words are. Because he loved me, believe it or not. Because he loved me. So, you catch that? The reason he came to earth and suffered and tortured and went to the cross is because he loved me. He loved you. So, everyone in the building, he loved you. Let's focus on that as we take the examples to remind us of that great gift that was given to us. <clears throat> Not a monetary gift, but the gift of God's 
sorry. Because we love you. And we love you. Thanks, Father. We are grateful that in your wisdom you have given us this memorial that we observe each week in memory of your greatest good, in memory of Jesus, in memory of the suffering he went through. Because he loved us. So Father, as we take this bread, that we remember and focus our minds on that body. And Jesus, please give us it. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> We ask your blessing on this cup. <coughs> the blood that was shed by Jesus. We remember, Father, that it was necessary for the blood to be shed in order for us sins to be forgiven. We're thankful that he was willing to go through the suffering of the cup. Father, as we take this and we look at our life being so cursed to the fact that we can have our sins forgiven through Him. Because he loved us so. How about our love for him? We have an opportunity this time to show our love, our dedication to him and our giving. Giving of our means. Giving you a cheerful way, and not only with our money, but with our lives. The dedication to Him and to His work. So, Father, we ask you to bless us in our giving. In Jesus' name. Don't have to say a word. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think I mentioned this once before. When this picture shows up, some of us are familiar with the study of Pat Love's dog, you know, with the bell. I think it was a bell. And the dog would salivate because he knew food was coming. We've just seen evidence of Pat Love. I'd invite you to stand for this next selection and remain standing for uh, the scripture reading. Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, 
that you may be my people, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, But I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to this people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Please be seated. Okay, good morning to you, church. Glad you've uh, ch chosen to join us this morning as we worship God. We dig into his word and continue in this series this morning of kind of our origins. Where, where all the stuff that we're joining now here in the church age is as the church of Christ where these things really got their start. And if you've been in Larry's class, perhaps this is kind of a good review for you as well. Uh, going all the way back to where you, you started and, and hopefully bringing it up to where we are now. As you can probably tell, we've skipped a lot of good stuff between the call of Abraham and what we might call the call of Moses. A lot of stuff has transpired, but we, we can't just go over everything, unfortunately. You'd be sick of me at that point, so we've we got to skip some stuff in between. But the long and the short of it, what, what we have missed is, well, we have seen God work through the lives of his people time and time again. We saw that in the uh, situation with Abraham, calling Abraham out of his home place where he had grown up. He'd known all these people his whole life. He sent off to a foreign country to have a new life, to become a nation born from God. Following in God's promises. And if you trace his history, well, then you see Isaac come along. And then Jacob, also known as Israel in, in his time. And this creates this new nation that was promised to Abraham. And then from there, you'd see Joseph come on the scene. Joseph's a great story. We, we could have talked about that, but we didn't. And we're not going to, sadly. Joseph comes along the scene. He comes from Jacob. He ends up in this high place in, guess what, in Egypt. And he brings God's people to Egypt, ultimately. And Joseph's family would settle there. They would multiply in great numbers for years and years and years, about 400 years, roughly. And eventually, there arose a pharaoh, a king, in Egypt that did not know or care about this God or God's people. And what ended up happening is God's people ended up enslaved in the land that they once found to be a great blessing under Joseph's leadership in subsequent years. And that's kind of where we're picking up the plot today. We're tracing out God's redemptive scheme throughout biblical history and some of these, these high points that you're probably at least somewhat familiar with. The big takeaway from our lesson today, if you are inclined to just take a nap or whatever, uh, that, that's okay, I guess. But the big takeaway from our lesson today is that God delivers his people because they can't deliver themselves. God delivers his people because they cannot deliver themselves. And this is a theme that we've seen in each of the lessons we've looked at so far. Going back to Adam and Eve. They tried to cover up their shame, their nakedness, their exposure because of the sin that they had brought upon themselves. They tried to fix it. God said, you're not going to be able to do that. And God fixed it. He moved forward to Abraham. Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness, not because he had this poor, perfect Morality or lived a perfect life, but because had, he had a living faith and he did not earn his standing before God, God blessed him with it. And as we see today, God's people are in a helpless situation. They're helpless to help themselves, to free themselves from their bondage and oppression. And yet we see it as God who takes the initiative, God who steps forth to work out his plan through Moses to deliver his people. See the common theme through all these things? It is God who saves. God who delivers. God who makes righteous. We're going to see that very same theme not only today, but uh, 
spoiler alert, and everything we look forward to in the series. What's interesting about our text today is that when you break it down, it bears a very similar resemblance to another very famous passage that you're probably familiar with in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And the pattern looks kind of like this. God identifies himself with some certain characteristics. Namely, in our text, is his holiness. He is holy. And we look to Matthew 28, and Jesus identifies himself by his authority. There's something you need to know about me as the Lord as you move forward on this commission that I'm giving you. And now, in Moses' case, it's holiness. In the disciples' case, in Matthew 28, it's Jesus' authority. And next you see the same pattern of God puts forth his plan for delivering his people. He's going to use Moses to go and free his people from their oppression and slavery. And Jesus puts forth his plan to deliver people with the good news of the gospel. We see back here in Exodus, God assures Moses with his divine and powerful sovereign presence. Well, what does Jesus assure his disciple with before sending them out on his commission? I'm with you always to the end of the age. So there's some very striking similarities here that I'd like for us to bear in mind as we make our way through. And so I'd like to start with that first point by discussing who God shows himself to be in this passage. Because this is foundational to following through with the rest of God's plan, not only in Moses' case, but also in our case. We need to know who it is that is addressing us. And the foundation of follow-through in God's plan is a recognition of the holiness of God. We need to recognize the holiness of God if we're going to have good follow-through in the commission of God. I'll draw our attention once more to our passage, Exodus 3, 1 through 6. Moses is out there, he's keeping the, uh, an eye on the sheep, keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. He goes out to the mountain of God, and this angel of the Lord appears to him out of fire in the midst of the bush. The bush is not being consumed. What a sight that would have been. Moses says, I'm going to go check that out. In verse 4, when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see God come to him from the bush, individually, Moses, you, I'm talking to you, Moses. Moses, here I am. Moses, don't come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And we see Moses' response. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Now, there's some free, a few key observations we need to make about God in this passage. One of the first things that we observe is the nature in which God appears before Moses. And he's described as a flame of fire. A flame of fire. Fire is something you take seriously. Uh, we can get kind of careless around it. I remember being a younger teenager. I had that little pyrotechnic kind of tendencies. I wanted to set stuff on fire because you know, that's what stupid teenage boys like to do. I've grown up a little bit. We want to take fire seriously. Because as we've seen out west in the wildfires, a little flame gets out of hand in a hurry and it, it can destroy everything. It's something you, you don't want to reckon with. Fire needs to be taken seriously. We also see in this appearance of fire, it's one that is self-perpetuating. It doesn't need the bush to be burned up to fuel itself. It, it doesn't need anything to sustain itself. And that tells us something about the nature of God here. Not only is he something not to be messed with, but something that is self-perpetuating and needs nothing else to continue on existing. His presence is one that requires careful consideration as well. Moses approaches this burning bush, approaching the presence of the Lord, and the Lord tells him, take your sandals off. Take off your shoes, because the very ground on which you are standing is holy. Just in the presence, not even not, not like touching or just in his general presence. That area is made holy just because of the presence of God being there. Moses was not to take this encounter lightly. 
We also see an allusion to his eternal nature, and here as well, when God identifies himself as, I am, presently, actively, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's been around for a long while. It's been many years since Abraham was on the scene. And this presence speaking to Moses from this burning bush is not being consumed as saying, I am the one who walked with those guys way back when. I've been doing this a long time. And that alludes to his eternal nature. He doesn't fade away. He, he's always present. He always is. And Moses' reaction showcases one last thing that's worth noting. Being in the presence of the holiness of God was frightening. It was frightening. He couldn't bear to look upon it. When he understood in whose presence he was now standing, he couldn't bear to, to gaze upon the bush that had once caught his attention. Recognizing the holiness of God is foundational to following through with God's plans because a proper understanding of God's holiness puts us in our proper place. When we see God for who he truly is in all of his holiness, it, it should send a very shrinking feeling upon us as just lowly creatures of his. Moses needed to see and understand that the one who would tell him to do all these things was altogether different, infinitely higher and infinitely superior to him. Moses needed to find his place in the a created order of things. He needed to feel the weight of being in God's presence that it might pro propel him forward in obedience. Now I think about this in my own life and, and for all of us really. I sometimes wonder if this is a very thing, a very contributing factor for the disobedience of many Christians today that we don't fully understand or feel the weight of God's holiness prompting us along to obedience. And so we just don't obey. We don't fully grasp the enormity of how, how holy God is and how much we don't compare to Him. That when we do find ourselves in His presence that we're kind of lackadaisical about we doesn't prompt us onward to obedience like it should. Could it be that we lack an understanding of our place before an infinitely holy God? That we're more like pals that hang out on the weekend rather than commissioned people under the rule of Almighty God? That's only for you to decide. But I do wonder. If people are to move forward with the commission that God gives them, they need to have a very strong sense of the holiness of God. Take him seriously. Recognize where they measure up against, against him and find our proper place in that order. But that's not all we need. That's not all that Moses needed. We also need to understand, coupled with an understanding of God's holiness, an understanding of God's heart as well. And yes, well, God is supremely holy and should be revered because of it. We should also understand how God thinks and feels and his concern for his people. He is supremely considerate and concerned about his people. I want to understand the heart of God. And after God has made his introductions and, and established his holiness in the life of Moses, he then goes on to explain to Moses how he perceives the situation that he finds his people in. The Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people. I've seen it. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, taskmasters, and I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and bring them out of the land, the good broad land, the promised land as we often refer to it. Verse 10, I will send you to Pharaoh that you might bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And then Moses goes on, well, are you sure about it? We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. 
God was concerned about the situation in which he found his people. Now, as I was thinking about this and putting this together, I tried to put myself in the, the shoes of perhaps one of these Hebrew people that had been enslaved. For 400 years, they had been in this land. Enslaved, oppressed, with no real claim to hope, no real end in sight. Just going about, about their days, day after day, dealing with whatever they had to deal with in this position. Many people in that 400 years had lived and died throughout that time who would never see this day of deliverance come. <coughs> My question would be, if I were them, why would God wait so long to act? He made my people promise that he would come. What has taken him so long? That's a worthy question. And if you've had that kind of a question going on in your own mind, whether it's from reading this or some other situation, it's a worthwhile question to ask. And unfortunately, the answer is, well, we can't know for sure. But we can make some observations from past events that might clue us in as to why God would wait so long to bring his deliverance to bear. Remember, God has, up to this point, waited for virtually every human devised option of hope to be taken off the table. We think about a situation like Abraham, for example. If there were some kind of human plan of achieving what God wanted to accomplish, God would wait until that plan could not come together. So that thing, when things did come together and things did turn out, the only way it could have turned out was because God was responsible for making it happen. For example, Abraham and Sarah having a child together when they were way past their years, when it was objectively hopeless for that to happen, that's when God stepped in and made it happen. And so I suspect because of examples like that, God allows for circumstances to become utterly hopeless by human ingenuity and human achievement so that when he acts, Everyone will know that he alone is God, and he alone delivers. Some might say, well, that's not fair. I have to deal with all this stuff in the meantime before God actually does anything. That's not fair to me. That's not fair to all these other people. Why would God allow people to suffer things like this just so he could prove a point? If you want to talk about fair, it's not fair that God should allow anyone who has sinned, has raised a hand of rebellion against him, to go unpunished. It's not fair that God would allow anything good or gracious to befall anybody, but because of his grace, love, and mercy, he allows us to go on. It's a very different perspective, but it's the better perspective when you really stop and think about it. This goes back to understanding God's holiness, who he is and who we are. Consider this too. As much as we may not like it or agree with it, we are created beings. We are creation. And we are His creation. And because of that relationship, as created beings, we are subject to His will. <coughs> he has full rights over what happens to us or does not happen to us. Whether we like it or not, now, thankfully, we can trust that God loves us and that God works all things out for good for us, for us who love God and call according to his purposes. God promises that that is, that is true for us. But that doesn't mean that suffering isn't something that we experience in the meantime. We need to recognize that God works all things together for good for those of us who love him and are called according to his purposes. And sometimes that working out involves great suffering. And one prime example of that is the working out for good is Jesus' death on the cross. Think about it. A horrible event that accomplished the utmost good for God's people. And we're the beneficiaries of that. But to get back to our passage, I, I got off course a little bit. We quickly get a picture of how God feels and what he intends to do for his people. 
He says, I've seen what's going on. I've seen it. My eyes have laid, laid upon it. I know what's going on. I've seen it. I hear the cries of my people. I know perfectly well what's going on. And I'm coming down to do something about it. God does care about the sufferings of his people. And because of that, he works out his plan of delivering them at the right time and in the right way, which is his time and his way. God wants his people to be freed from enslavement and oppression. God not only wants his people to be free of these things, but he also wants to bless his people like they've never known before by, by deliver them, delivering them from slavery into a land flowing of milk and honey. He says, I'm going to take you out of the worst situation and bring you into the best situation, a place of blessing where I am with you. When, my, when I read this, my mind is brought to the words of Jesus, our deliverer. I have come that they might have life and life abundantly. We see pictures of Jesus all the way back with the situation with Moses, which I, I think is amazing. Another thing we observe about the heart of God is that he intends to include humanity, people, fallen people. He intends to include fallen people in his plans for deliverance. He involves Moses, this lowly shepherd, as the spokesman to his people in the mouthpiece of God to Pharaoh. Who's Moses? He asks the question, who am I that you would send me to do this? That's amazing that God would include people like Moses to do this kind of a, kind of a work. And this is, once again, another beautiful picture of what we come to see in the New Testament with Jesus. When Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus is the good shepherd. Like Moses was a shepherd to Israel, Jesus the shepherd. Jesus comes on the scene to deliver his people from the slavery and oppression of sin, and he comes declaring the good news to his people. And so when we consider moving forward with our commission, just as Moses had to with his, we must understand first God's holiness, who he is, where we line up with that. We need to understand his heart. What is he concerned about? What is he desiring to accomplish with his people? Lastly, we need to understand his help. His holiness, his heart, and his help. And his help, as we see here, is namely in his presence. He's with Moses. He is going to be with his people, and so we need to have the assurance of his help. 3, 13 through 15 says, the Moses, Moses said to the Lord, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, Who's that? What's his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am. I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, Say to this people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. God's people, if they had remembered anything, would remember these, these past patriarchs of the faith that God had faithfully worked with through all these ages. He's He's hearkening back to these days of old. Remember these guys? I'm the same God that worked with them, and I'm here for you now. You know, Moses, he's clearly a little trepidatious about this plan. If you keep reading, you can see how it kind of seems to try and squirm out of it a little bit. He found this new responsibility. He's like, ah, I can't do this. I'm not good at speaking, you know. But God takes care of it. He gives him the help he needs. Here, though, we see yet another foundational element of following through with the commission is resting in the assurance of the presence and the help of the one who has sent you. We rest in the presence and the help of the one who sent us. In whose name am I coming to these people and saying and doing all of these things, Lord? Who's sending me? Who's with me? Who's, who is helping me through this? I am. I am. The self-existing, the eternal one, who is the God of all your fathers before you, is with you now to help you. 
and so as Moses embarks on his commission, he must remember who is sending him, who is with him, who is empowering him, and who will ultimately accomplish all of the things he's been commissioned to do. And it bears a striking resemblance to Jesus' words to his disciples, don't you think? Jesus came to them saying, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So next week, tune in, same time, same channel. Next week, we will see how God's plan of deliverance for his people unfolds a little further. And what was required to usher in that deliverance. We conclude with the thought that if deliverance is to be had, it's only because God has accomplished it through Jesus. Just a little heads up. I invite you to just take a look at this picture for a moment. I don't know what it would have really looked like. Probably something like this. What kind of thoughts does it conjure up in your mind? You consider what it may have looked like to witness these things. If you could have been a fly on the wall, this conversation with Moses. You know, Moses can now benefit from seeing the big picture of what God was accomplishing through him in this moment. I don't think he had a real great idea of what all was going to transpire. But now he can. He can look back and see it. He stood in the holy presence of God on that day. I'm sure things were not as clear for him. And yet he remained committed to the Lord's cause. How would you react if you were brought into this moment? Just think about that. How would you react if you were brought into this moment before the holy presence of God like this? And God said, I'm sending you. I'm sending you to do this. What might your reaction be? How do you understand and respond to the holiness of God? Perhaps you don't really have a great understanding of it. Maybe that's that's not a concept you've talked about much or thought about much. Uh, and, and you just don't understand. You've got some questions about it. And that's okay. But don't stay there. We want to talk to you about it help you understand it. Perhaps you do feel that way of God's holiness, but you're not really sure what to do in light of that. Well, perhaps maybe the holiness of God just isn't really much anything to you. You don't, you don't care. I'd invite you to change your mind. Do you have a grasp on the heart of God and what he's always desired to do for his people? A desire to deliver them and bless them? Do you see the beauty of Jesus' life and ministry parallel in the things that we've studied so far? See how these things have really come to bear in the life of Christ? And if you're not quite seeing it, hang with us. We'll hope, hopefully you'll see more of it as we move away along. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Are you assured by God's presence when you go about your day and strive to bring a good word to the people around you? Are you taking up your commission? Perhaps you've Heard that good word, and you're ready to commit to the Lord's cause. If you need to start by being immersed in the waters of baptism today, as the Lord has commanded for all of his people to do, we can help you to obey in that manner today, or whatever, just, just do it. It's good for you. If you've already done that, but you're ready to get involved in a perhaps a bigger capacity, a better way, we're ready to get you plugged in. We could use you. But whatever your needs might be, we hope that you'll come today. Come forward, and we might serve you. Why don't you come as we stand this
again, thank you, David. A lot to digest, a lot to contemplate, and yes. <laughs> uh, this evening is our uh, monthly prayer service, and given the state of affairs um, in our nation, all that has been going on, especially with our uh, southern uh, citizens and our brethren with all the destruction from the storms. Our prayer service is going to be centering around the storms of life. And uh, we would invite you to come back for that at 6 o'clock as we uh, sing songs and uh, meditate upon those prayers um, for it. Just as a, sad, uh, um, a uh, side note, I happen to have a granddaughter who is having her 11th birthday today. So if you would like to say something to her, do it. Um, in two weeks, I think it's two weeks, uh, we have our widow's outing, but we also have our trunk or treat and we need candy. Uh, so please bring some candy because we usually run out. It's, it's gotten really big. And our neighbor is usually pretty good and he's a good draw and a good draw for the church as well. So uh, please do that. So without any other uh, announcement, please come back uh, tonight at 6 o'clock. I want Jesus to walk with me. <laughs> walk with me, walk with me, bless my eyes, no longer see.
Oh gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come here, sing praises, and worship you. With everything going on in this country and the world, it's making us feel a little anxious, and we ask that we can cast our anxiety on you, as we know you're the only one that can help us with that. We also ask for your strength and your wisdom to get us through the trials of life. We thank you so much, Father, for everything you do and the blessings that we receive each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.